We begin the day with the pre-inaugural plenary sessions, ladies and gentlemen. We begin the Infocom 2017 conference with a leadership keynote on leading organizational transformation in a digital age. We are very privileged to have amongst us Dr. Nirmalya Kumar, internationally renowned professor of marketing with Singapore Management University, Harvard Business School, Kellogg School of Management, and more. We warmly welcome you, sir. This leadership key keynote is brought to you by Rice Education and Adams University. May I now invite Professor Madhusudan Chakraborty, Vice Chancellor, Adams University, to introduce the session and welcome Dr. Nirmal Yakumar. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege for me to introduce the first speaker of this event today. And we have among us Dr. Nirmala Kumar. Dr. Nirmala Kumar is known as the internationally renowned marketing guru. Dr. Nirmala Kumar is a Lee Kong Chian professor of marketing at Singapore Management University and a distinguished executive fellow at INSERD Emerging Market Institute. He is a former member of group of executive council at Tata Sons, wherein he was responsible for the group strategy reporting to the then chairman, Mr. Cyrus Mistry. He has a PhD in marketing from Northwestern University winning the Marketing Science Institute Aldin G. Clayton Award for his PhD dissertation. He is one of the world's leading thinkers on strategy and marketing, who was previously taught at Columbia University, Harvard Business School, IMD Switzerland, London Business School, and Northwestern University Kellogg School of Management. He has been a consultant to 50 Fortune 500 companies in 60 different countries, and has served on several boards of directors, including SCC, Ambuja Cement, Bata India, Tata Capital, Alta Tech, and Jensar, all with billions of dollars in capitalization. I'd like to keep the introduction uh, short with this. Let me invite Professor Ninmal Kumar, and let me also avail this opportunity to felicitate him on behalf of Adamas University and Rice Group. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind introduction. Please come. It's a typical Indian way of felicitating. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Small memento from University. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's my great honor and pleasure and privilege to be the first speaker today. Uh, I'm going to start uh, by, with a short video, uh, but you know, the first and most important point I'd like you to remember from my presentation is that technology in digital are enablers. What is different about technology and digital is the impact that it has. And today, and digital is not new, digital has been around now for 50 years almost, but we are at a particular moment in time when the impact of digital on our human lives is quite vast and incredible and life-changing. It is going to change how people work, it's going to change how people interact with each other, and it's changing how we consume our products and services. And as a result, businesses are having to transform their business models, and they're having to transform how they market and sell their products and services. 
So to show you the impact of digital on ordinary lives, I would like to start with a short video. If you could play the video, please. मैं बिहार से हूँ मेरे फादर रेलवे वर्कर थे मैं टेंथ क्लास तक पढ़ा हूँ हर किसी का एक सपना रहता है कि अगर वो मान लीजिए एक कारीगर है तो कारीगर से एक मास्टर बनेगा मास्टर से एक कारखाने वाला तो उसी तरीके से जब मैं काम करता तो मुझे लगा नहीं कुछ करना चाहिए तो सडनली ये आइडिया आया कि बस बॉम्बे चलो वहाँ पे कुछ काम सीखना है जब मैं धरावी में आया था तो उस समय मेरे अंकल ऑलरेडी जैकेट का काम करते थे तो उनके पास ही आया दस बाय अठारह का रूम था उसमें ही बाड़े लोग सोते थे ना और फिर वहाँ पर ही काम पे लग जाना सुबह से लेकर रात के ग्यारह बजे तक एक अजीब सा लगता था उस समय उस समय जिस समय मैं आया था तो उस समय तो काम सीखने वाले को उतना कुछ नहीं मिलता था सिर्फ खाना पीना और हफ्ते का जो खर्चा रहता है वो फिर दो साल मैंने काम किया वहाँ पर दो साल के बाद फिर मैं गोवा चला गया क्योंकि तो एक्चुअली क्या हुआ था वहाँ पर वो गारमेंट बंद हो गया तो मैं गोवा गया गोवा में काम करता था मैंने फर्स्ट सेकेंड ईयर जब मैं गोवा में काम करता था उसमें लैपटॉप खरीद लिया था तो बस लैपटॉप लेना था कुछ करना था कुछ करना बस उसमें ही था उसके बाद फिर यूँ ही मोबाइल से कनेक्ट करके नेट चलाना उस समय ऐसा ही रहता था फिर यहाँ पर आया जब यहाँ पर काम करने लगा तो फिर यहाँ पर खुद का ये हुआ कि नहीं मुझे कुछ करना है लैपटॉप पर ही करते करते फिर मुझे ई के बारे में पता चला रजिस्ट्रेशन करने के बाद फिर कुछ प्रोडक्ट डाला था तो उस समय मैंने लो बजट में काम स्टार्ट किया था तो जब ये फर्स्ट मंथ में सेल ज़्यादा हुआ फिर वही पैसे को थोड़ा बचाकर किसी और से लेकर एक रूम लिया एक मशीन फिर उधर ही काम करने लगा खुद से ही फिर एक से दो दो से तीन इस तरह फिर ग्रो होने लगा डिजिटल वर्ल्ड में दुनिया के बारे में जानने के लिए मिला मुझे किस तरह लोग बिजनेस करते हैं फिर जब वहाँ पर बिजनेस स्टार्ट हुआ तो फिर लगा कि नहीं खुद का एक ब्रांड होना चाहिए फिर ब्रांड एक बनाया स्किन आउटफिट उसके ब्रांड जब हुआ तो उसको ट्रेडमार्क देना है फिर ट्रेडमार्क दिया ट्रेडमार्क के बाद फिर उसको एश्योरिटी देना है तो फिर मैंने आई करवाया और अभी तो फिलहाल जैकेट है उसके बाद बैग्स वॉलेट बेल्ट इस वक्त ई बे एमेजोन बोनजा इस्टी ये चार वेबसाइट्स पर सेल कर रहा हूँ और अब तक में तो अराउंड अब 60 कंट्री में मेरे प्रोडक्ट जा चुके हैं फिल तो बहुत अच्छा होता है कि 60 कंट्री जिसका नाम मैंने सुना भी नहीं है उस जगह में मेरे प्रोडक्ट जा रहे हैं स्टार्टिंग में आया था तो उस समय 5000 मंथली होता था आज वन लैक्स पर मंथ और अगर डिजिटल दुनिया ना होता ऑनलाइन शॉपिंग नहीं होता तो शायद मैं इस जगह पर नहीं होता Thank you. You know the the point uh, that I will be continuing to emphasize is that you know it's really the impact on people that is the most important thing. And what this digital technology does is, in a sense, it's an enabler which allows people to realize their potential, and it removes some of the blockages that were there between people and their potential. And you know uh, the interesting thing is that today we are at a unique time in our history. because we have the digital but we have these five elements of digital that have come together and they've come together and matured in a particular manner that allows them to leverage each other's strength and that is what is new about digital today and i'm going to start with the most obvious one which is mobile because sometimes you know and in in a sense the reason you start with a video and a picture is sometimes a picture says a thousand words and here you see in the most traditional of setting 
everybody has a camera phone. You know, Starbucks did some study and they found that if you're missing your wallet, you won't know about it for at least half an hour. But if you're missing your mobile phone, within 30 seconds, you'll know I don't have my mobile phone on me. You know, that's how ubiquitous the mobile phone has become to everybody. And in the future, you know, the mobile phone is still a very awkward device because you have to carry it with you everywhere and you can lose it. And in the future, we are wondering, why do you have to carry the mobile phone? Why can't we just, as soon as you are born, implant you, ingest you, or inject you with a SIM card? You know? And so Google is now working on the ingestible SIM card so that you are always on, really. The second thing <coughs> is, of course, the social media, which is ubiquitous in our lives today. And if a regime in Egypt can be overthrown in 17 days using Facebook or Twitter, imagine the impact on business. And what is different about this social media is that especially you can see the impact in the media industry, since we are here at a media industry event. You know, earlier, who were the powerful people in the media industry? These were the editors. They decided what newspaper stories would be published, what magazine articles would be carried, what movies would be shown in the theaters, what television programs would be aired, what books would be published, what entries would be entered into Encyclopedia Britannica. <coughs> Along came Google and Yahoo and YouTube. Suddenly, you as a consumer were in charge. You decided what you would watch, what you would read. That is all very good. Now, with the social media world, what is increasingly happening is media is being consumed off Facebook and Twitter feeds, which means increasingly it's not the editors who are powerful. It's not even you who is powerful, even though you think you are. It's your friends who are deciding what media you should be watching. Because it's that collective wisdom of your friends that determines what media you are going to be presented when you log on to Facebook or onto Twitter. Now, of course, the disadvantage of this is that you get more and more tunnel vision. You see, when you opened the newspaper, you had to read whatever stories were there, and there was a broadness to that exposure. Today, what's happening is more and more we can start limiting ourselves only to, because on Facebook, what news stories are they going to show you? They're going to show you the news stories that you're most likely to click on. Remember, that's the revenue model, which means it's going to be those news stories which are similar to what you have clicked on in the past and similar to what your friends are clicking on which makes for a very tunnel vision, right? So we have to also remember that with every advantage also comes a disadvantage. And that's the big thing, you know, that instead of BBC deciding what you watch, with YouTube and I, BBC iPlayer, you decided what you watch, but increasingly your, your friends are going to decide what you watch. For example, all TVs that are now being built are being built media-enabled, internet-enabled. So you log on to the TV with your, like you do in Netflix, with your profile. Once you log on via Facebook with your profile onto the television set, instead of asking you, these are the movies you can see or these are the shows you can see, it starts off by telling you, these are the shows your friends are watching right now. Now you decide, you want to watch some other show or what your friends are watching. And if you decide to watch what your friends are watching, you can even have the comment commentary on the side between you and your friends. What we have done and what we are increasingly looking at doing is how do we turn the consumption experience from a solitary experience into a social experience? And this is not so new. For those of you who are from Calcutta like me, 40 years ago when I was a kid and the television came on in the evening, there was one poor soul in my building who had a television set in his living room. Unfortunately for him, at 6 o'clock, all the children in the building used to turn up at his doorstep and sit in his living room and watch television with him. It was a social experience, great fun for all of us, not so much for him. Now, with Facebook login, you're doing the same thing. You're recreating that social aspect of consumption. And that is the very big change that is taking place. But of course, for that, you have to give up your privacy. You have to tell, let people know what you're watching. And you also have to give up some element of free choice, 
right? It's like the owner decided which show we would watch. But that time there was only one channel, so it wasn't a big deal. But today, it's the consensus of your friends that will decide which show which you will watch. The third thing is the cloud. The cloud is really incredible. And the reason it's incredible is because infinity is the number it is associated with. Your mobile device, no matter how powerful, and mine is quite powerful, has 5,000 songs downloaded on my phone. I have 5,000. I used to be a DJ, but that's okay. 5,000 songs. But why do you limit yourself to 5,000 songs when you can have the entire library of the world on your fingertips? And so this data is old, but last year was the first year when streaming overtook downloads as consumption of music. Right? Because if you can have the world's library, why would you limit yourself to your library? No. So, very big change. The cloud has become huge because it allows you this always connected, always on, infinite. And of course, then comes the internet of things. Not only your mobile phone, but your home, your car, your refrigerator, all will be connected. And the current pro prognosis is that for the average person in five years or three years now, you will have, on average, person will have seven devices connected to the internet. Some of you are probably saying, I already have more than seven, right? But this is the average for the world. Now, of course, all these different, and for example, one example, which is you know, very close to my heart is the automotive industry. And if you look at the automotive industry, we have three, tech, three you know, what you call types of connectivity. The first connectivity is what we call beamed in. This is, you have a radio on your television, on your, in your car, the signals are beamed into that radio. <coughs> the second is brought in. You take your mobile phone or you take your tablet inside the car, and that's already brought in by you. And the third is built in, which is that when the car is being manufactured, increasingly the parts of the car will be connected to the internet, and they'll be beaming stuff all the time. What this is important for is, you know, currently a car is 90% hardware, 10% software. We are expecting that to become more 50-50. Now what that means is, just like your phone gets upgraded all the time, why can't your car also be upgraded all the time? You see, and just like your phone is constantly sending diagnostic information to Apple or whoever your phone is belonging to, why can't the car be sending continuous diagnostic information to the manufacturer? And this is what makes it so exciting. And that's why you see that the new players of the car industry are not coming from the automotive sector. They are coming from the technology sector. Whether it's the Uber or whether it's Google self-driving cars. Because they realize that the, as the car moves more to a software, the traditional capabilities of the auto companies instead of becoming capabilities, become core rigidities. It's what stops them from making the change. So you'll see new players coming. And of course, the amount of smoke signals that we are going to get from all these Internet of Things makes, it, makes for the fifth part, which is the big data. So the big data really is not big data, firstly. It's a lot of little data. But it's a lot of little data coming from the mobile phone, from the social media, from the cloud, and from the Internet of Things. And all this little media, little data that is coming from different places has to be put together and consolidated and cleaned and refined for it to become anything of use. You know? So, of course, I'm very excited about big data, and it seems that the world is also. This is an n-gram. n-gram is a Google Books technology which looks at how often a word appears in English language books. And as you can see, data is the new oil. But you know, the, the thing that you have to remember is, they are saying that 90% of all the data created has been created in the last two years. That's the explosion of data that is taking place. 90% of all data 
has been created in the last two years. That's like the explosion of data that is taking place. But data is like sand grains. You know, it can disorient you. It can blind you. They say, there's a whole Bedouin saying that it takes exactly six minutes in a sandstorm for a man to go mad. And it's the same thing with big data. You have so much data coming, you can go mad. But it's like oil. You have to refine it to be able to use it to make better decisions. And as marketers, we were always interested in this. Because as marketers, we always wanted to know, who are you as a customer? Who are your friends? Where are you located? What are your interests? And we never knew all of this. And this is the new reality, that because of this big data, we can be so much more effective in doing this stuff. For example, facial recognition is a technology that has become quite big. You know, why do I need this badge? If you had a facial recognition camera in the entrance, everybody who's a delegate, the images had been uploaded, it would automatically give a green or a red light and stop you at the door without you having to be told. If you look at the major airports in the world today, all major airports in the world today are using facial recognition technology. The moment you walk into the airport, there's a guy somewhere behind, and a technology, not a guy, but a technology behind that is scanning your face, relating it to all faces of known problem makers in the world. Before you have actually approached the check-in desk, this technology has already been activated. It's the same thing department stores are using it now. Because in a department store, when you enter, they take your image, they flash it and compare it with, are you one of their most valuable customers, in which case somebody should come down to receive you? Or are you a known shoplifter, in which case also somebody should come down to receive you? You see, so this is what we want is, again, technology as an enabler, changing how we behave and how we do things. And the more it is done without obtrusion, the better it is the more effective it is, you see, so that it becomes more efficient, it increases efficiency. Same thing, who are your friends? Now imagine who are your friends, why is it so valuable? Suppose you are looking to buy a new digital camera, not many people are willing to do that anymore, but there is still an industry called digital camera. If you went to Google and you type in digital camera, the power of Google is such that you will probably get and I'm not exaggerating, 20 million hits for digital camera. You've completely gone mad, right? What will I do with these 20 million hits? Now suppose I have a search function in Facebook. So you go in as a Facebook user with your profile, you type in digital cameras, and I only throw up 17 cameras for you, which are owned by your friends. Now you tell me which search is more valuable to you as a marketer. You see, it's not the amount of information, it's the context of that information which makes it valuable, you see? So that's what you know. You trust your friends more than you trust Google, you know, for, for a recommendation. Where are you? Four square, all this low, that's why Google is pushing location tagging so much. That's why Facebook is pushing location tagging so much. We know that a mobile offer sent to you for a restaurant or a mobile offer sent to you for a store is several times more effective when you are near that store or that restaurant. So if I know your location, and this is what I know all the time because of your mobile phone, then I know what offer to send you when, based on where you are. But this is a different stream of data that has to be reconciled with the other streams of data that are coming from you. Because these digital smoke signals have to be all aligned together to make this work. And then what products and services interest you? And again, Instagram, which has become so hot for that reason, because it, you already tell people, this is what I want. This is what I'm looking for. And so that's, you know, and with this data, we would like to be as marketers, you know, like now when you start typing in Google, or on your phone, it already tells you which word you're typing before you're finished. That's what we want to do as marketers. Before you have started searching, before you have finished searching, we should be able to find the right product or service for you. It's like that auto, -cor auto correction, you know? So that's what we are trying to achieve. But 
with the connected world, already what I've told you has already probably made you say, hey, listen, folks, there are some concerns here. Before we had cars, we did not have traffic laws, by the way. The traffic laws came after the cars were quite ubiquitous. You see, the laws have to follow. It's the same thing. We cannot deny that there is a privacy issue. And as business, we should not deny it. We should confront it, face it, resolve it for customers in a way that works for them, that works for the public policy makers. Because if we don't do that, then the privacy concerns can stymie some of these advantages. So we should allow people the choices and options to opt in and opt out as the cases may be. Because people have legitimate concerns about privacy. You know, where is my data being stored? How much, how secure is it? How private it is? Who's got the right to use it? The entire Reliance Geo, you know, where you're getting this mobile telephony and internet connectivity for a low price, it's not a mobile telephony game. It's a data game they're playing. You know, we need to understand a lot of these businesses. For example, selling airline tickets on the internet as an aggregator is not a money-making business. It's only money-making because of the data and the ancillary revenues you get from advertising because of that data. But if you just look at the commissions got from ticket sales of airlines, there's no money to be made. You can't make a business out of it. So, but there's a shift that companies are taking in the capabilities that are needed. You know, in the old days, when we did those big TV advertisements, you had these madmen that were made famous in the TV serial, madmen. These were highly creative people. They used to think up of these wonderful, great ideas and launch breathtaking ads on television. Then came Google. Suddenly, the power moved from the creative madmen to the quants. And the quants were people who just knew algorithms. And they knew how to optimize the Google algorithms. And that was what the key skill was. So the madmen lost power, and these algorithm nerds became powerful. Now, with social media, it's changing. Because in social media, we need people who have the capability to do both kind of things at some level. Also, you know, with this big data and everything, we need to find people who can ask the right questions from a manager's perspective, who can understand the analytics from a statistician's perspective, and who can then communicate the results from an organizational perspective. And what you're finding in companies today is, we are very excited about big data, but we can't find the right kind of resource to exploit and manage that data and in a way that is usable by the person on the front line. And that challenge still exists for us, you know. As Google often says, our products are made by engineers, but they're not used by engineers. And the media consumption that is changing is changing dramatically. As you can see, you think about yourself. How much time do you spend reading the newspaper? Okay, in this room, I'd say some. If this room was X 20 years younger, I would say none. Right? People just... If I tell my daughter a newspaper, she doesn't even know what a newspaper is. She never gets the newspaper at home. You see, so we have to understand how media consumption is changing. And this is where you are seeing over here the World Wide Web and average media consumption in America. This is America numbers. Six hours on World Wide Web, 3.5 hours on TV. And that 3.5 hours is because there are a lot of old people. 1.1 hours on, on radio, and then 0.7 hours on the traditional press. While this has changed, you, the biggest change you can see is, you know, since I come from the university world, one of the big things in universities was when you went to the first day of the university, you know, when it opens on fall semester in America, you would see these people selling these $50 televisions. And you would see every kid who would come to their school dorm would buy one small television for the dorm room. $50 to $100, that was the sweet spot for those televisions, right? And they're just a small 12-inch thing. Even I had one when I was in my PhD program in my room. Now you go to dorm rooms, there's no televisions in anybody's dorm room. They all have their laptop. They connect their laptop to the always-on internet, which is great at any university. And they basically see whatever they want to see. Unfortunately, marketers are still slow. If you look at the amount of money being spent 
on traditional media versus our internet, there's a big imbalance. Even today, only a few countries like UK and Sweden are approaching 50% of the media expenses on internet. In India, it's less than 10%. So what I'm trying to say is consumer eyeballs have moved, but the advertising dollars have not moved. But this gap cannot remain for a long time. And part of the reason they have not moved is because it requires new skills. You know, we know how the 30 second advertisement on television works. We know how newspaper advertising works. But we are still trying to figure out how the social media work. And here, I'm going to say a couple of things only which are important to remember. When you are on Google, advertising works very well. Because when you are on Google, you are searching for information. So advertising on Google works really well. When you're on Facebook, it's a private space for you and your friends. You are not looking for advertising. So advertising as a platform, and especially the banner kind of ad, which we love to you know, cover the screen with, doesn't work on Facebook too well. You need to think about how do I con 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 convert the purchase and the consumption experience into a social one. <laughs> so, for example, Ticketmaster, they sell tickets to shows, concerts. If you log on with your Facebook profile into Ticketmaster, they will tell you for which show, which of your friends have booked tickets. And then you can buy a seat either next to them or away from them as your preference may be. You see, because again, I'm enhancing the power of that social media to enhance my value proposition to the customer. And that is what we need to do, rather than just banging people on the head with more banner ads. And the reason I talk mostly about Facebook and Google, here's an incredible statistic. If you take China out of the picture, because China, you know, doesn't allow Google or Facebook. So if I take China out of the picture, 84 percent 84% of all digital ad expenditures are on Google and Facebook combined. That tells you the power of the duopoly. That tells you how much information they have and how it's a winner-take-all kind of game. And of course, in the shopping experience, which we all know very well, Consumers are increasingly using the online as a way to enhance their shopping experience. You know, the number of consumers, you can't read this chart, you don't need to read this chart, I'll tell you what it says. The number of consumers who only go to a store and shop in the store are very few, less than 20%. The rest of them either go online and shop online, or go online and then go to the store and shop in the store, or go online, then go to the store, then go back online to shop. You see, so we have to have as a, as a brand, as a manufacturer, we have to have presence on all the distribution channels. This makes distribution, of course, very complex, because how do you give the customer a consistent experience across all your channels? Especially when the control on the web of the pricing and the experience is a lot less than in the physical world for a brand. And so brands have to have a more complex distribution system. Channel conflict will increase. They have to have their own web presence. They also have to be on the present on the aggregators of web like the Amazons of the world. They have to have their own physical presence. And they also have to be in the physical presence of the aggregators like the retail stores. And so this channel conflict has become a major view for manufacturers of how to manage and uh, you know we need to think and of course you have to customize for every country like when ebay came to india ebay in usa 25 percent is c to c consumer to consumer sales in india is zero it's all b to c same thing in 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 um, ebay usa is all credit card transactions in india they had to take cash on delivery so we have to customize and but Having said everything about digital, I also don't want to forget there is a role for the physical world. 
if you have a proposition. Zara has a proposition. And despite all of the wonderful stories about the online and online shopping, they have increased their stores from 500. Last year's number was 2,500. This year's number is 2,500, sorry. Just recent number. So they've gone five times in stores open across the world. So if you have a great physical proposition, there is still a market for it. Huh? It's not that there is no market for it. But most industries will have to transform. I'm not going to show this because it's become too obvious now. But, you know. but what is the surprising thing? And this and now I'm going to close from where I started. Just like that young man's life was changed by the digital world. In India, we have an opportunity. Because our physical infrastructure is so weak, we have the opportunity to leapfrog using digital selectively. You know? So for example, we are never going to get to credit cards penetration the way they are in the Western countries because it's just not going to happen in India. But everybody in India now almost has a mobile phone. So a mobile wallet, digital wallets is definitely the way. The, the credit card industry in this country will go somewhere, but it's never going to go the way the digital, because we are going to leapfrog that entire credit card industry into the digital wallets, because that's where the potential of India is with respect to that. Same thing with the automotive industry. Very major changes coming to the automotive industry, you know, because of the ride sharing things. I can tell you, if I go to London, since I have an apartment, I'm from Calcutta, so I have an apartment here, but I also have an apartment in London. In London today, less than 25% of my friends own a car. Less than 25%. I have not owned a car in London for the last 10 years that I've lived there. It just doesn't make any sense. You can't find any parking. You, even if you find parking, it's going to be far away from where you want to go. Chauffeurs are unaffordable. So everybody's using Uber. And not only Uber, they just outside my apartment, three cars are always parked. There's a rental car service, you get a digital number, you plug in the digital number, you take the car, you drop it anywhere you want, you plug in your digital number and they charge you for the hours you have used the car. So car ownership is a declining fact of life. And what, there's a University of Berkeley, they did a study and they showed that for every car that a car is added to the car sharing industry, 13 less cars are sold in America. 13, one, three for every car that is added. Because that's about the capacity utilization, right? How many hours do you use a car in a day? Two hours, three hours? So if there's 24 hours in a day, it makes sense that about 10 to 12 cars less should be sold regardless, right? If you're, because people don't, there's no reason to have a second car because of Uber. So, but beyond the obvious that you'll have less car sales, you'll have less car rental companies, less taxis. There's also, you know, other things. Like if more and more of the, cars are going to be bought, bought by car sharing companies, then most of the car sales are going to become B2B. They're going to be negotiated in huge quantities. Insurance is going to be negotiated in huge quantity. This is going to have big impact on the car industry. And if those cars are being used 24 hours a day, instead of six hours or two hours on average a car is used, then of course the consumption of the car will go up, the maintenance services will go up, the tire consumption will go up, Right? So whether the tire consumption goes down in one end and increases in the other end, we don't know the full impact of this, but still, there are some things. So the replacement cycles will be, yes. But what is really happening with all of this is that there's a value migration taking place from the traditional incumbent firms to the new emerging business models. There's a transformation taking place from how people are living their lives, who, how they are going to work, they're going to become part of the gig economy, how they're going to interact with each other on social media, and how they're going to consume their products and services through online. And that is the big change. Technology and digital is the enabler, but it's lives and businesses that are being transformed. Thank you very much. <laughs> Madam Raki, I'm on time. Sure, I can take one or two questions. How much time do we have? You'll tell me when the time is over, right? Okay, sure. I think it's a hard context 
and uh, setting in which you ask questions. But anyway, we have a gentleman back there who wants to ask a question. Okay, he has a microphone. Hi. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hi, my name is Romit. I represent a company called Third Life. Uh, we are in the um, f uh, digital fraud detection space. Um, quick question on mobile wallets and also the darker side of the digital world, which is on digital terrorism right now. There's a lot of activity in that space. And while on the consumer side, there's a viral effect and people will adopt. Uh, my question is whether we are ready from a security and safety standpoint to be part of that digital world and what's happening in the Western world in this space, how people are getting geared yeah. uh, to No, I think you, are, you have an excellent question. See, the technology allows a lot of possibilities. The gentleman's question is a very simple one. It says, are we as a human being ready to make use of all those digital possibilities that are there? For example, driverless cars. Clearly, driverless cars is fantastic. No doubt about that. But let me ask you this. Suppose you are in a car, and the other person is driving and you are driving. One of you makes a mistake, and somebody dies. I accept it. Human beings are fallible. I accept it. Now, suppose you are driving the car, and there's a driverless car. The driverless car decides you are going to crash into him, that car. They have to make a decision. Should they let you survive, or should the three, since you are only one in your car, or should the three passengers in their car survive? They make a decision based on analytics that three people are more valuable than one person. So I'm going to avoid this crash in such a way that the other person dies. Would you like that decision to be made by the machine? I mean, technically, the answer is very clear, right? You should die and the other person should, three should live because they are three and you are one. But you know, we are not willing to accept that answer as yet. It's the same thing, you know, with planes. Clearly, you don't need a pilot in the plane, right? But would you feel comfortable getting on the plane without a pilot? So I think there's a huge change that is required. Also, we have to remember that change is at two levels. One is people like me, a dinosaur changing. The other is my daughter, who's 16, changing. Maybe we have different answers to the same problem. Thank you, madam. All right, my time is up. I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. We heartily thank you, Dr. Nirmalaya Kumar. May we request you to kindly remain on stage for just a couple of minutes. And may I request Mr. Didi Prakash, the Managing Director and CEO, ABB Private Limited, and Chairman Infocom, <coughs> to kindly come forward and present a memento to Dr. Nirmalaya Kumar. Thank you very much. Ladies Thank and gentlemen, you. please put your hands together for Dr. Nirmalaya Kumar for such an interesting session. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much.